Yeah, um, hello everyone. My name is Oluwa Femi Obadawi. Um, welcome to our webinar on the mobile application security. Uh, if you have any challenges or any question, you can make use of the Q&A to drop your question and I um, um, can guarantee you that we are trying to it accordingly. So um, these are just a few things about me. Um, I'm a graduate of computer engineering, uh, certified PCB lead penetration tester professional. I'm a certified to work. I have ISO 2001 lead editor, uh, MIT cybersecurity professional. I have certified various organizations to the PCADSS, both in Nigeria and outside Nigeria. And I've carried out network and application security to both uh, for organization in Nigeria and outside Nigeria. And I've facilitated numerous trainings too, uh, ranging from the secure coding training and the likes, both in Nigeria and outside Nigeria. Uh, about digital encode, um, digital encode actually is a leading consulting and speeded firm, and which was founded in 2013. And um, our services range from penetration testing, network security, vulnerability management, computer forensics, um, all the computer standard ranging from ISOs, uh, PCI DSS, and the likes. And we actually was appointed by CBN Center Bank of Nigeria as their technical partner since 2012, and the appointment was renewed in 2015. Uh, these are just the milestone of Dixta Encode over the years. And this type code is actually a multi award winning company. These are some of the awards that we have over the years. And these are the founder, um, Dr. Pa and Dr. Olu. Um, based on what they have done in the industry over the years, um, they actually gave them honorary doctor degree. And both of them are doctors now. And this is the letter showing their partnership with CBN. So um, the training objective is actually to, number one, to provide practical training on security assessment and testing practice on mobile application. Um, to provide an overall description of both suits, which of the one of the tools that we're going to show you um, this morning for mobile application audit and vulnerability scanning of, for requests and API endpoints on mobile application, and to even demonstrate how bootstrap attack can be done on mobile application, to show you how you can automate um, your scan using both suits to, to analyze section token and the like, and to provide them participants with the knowledge on how to actually run an interactive mobile application security test. And last one is to make sure that all the participants that attend this training will be able to run the most optimal code or bugs and to one point to one attack using repeater, which is one of the tools in um, Bob's, which I'm going to show you. And Bob's is actually a the middle tools that people use. So this is the agenda for today. Um, the introduction, so we'll talk about the evolution of first scenario for mobile. Then we'll talk about mobile device cyber attack. We'll talk about the mobile application security management life cycle. Then definitely we are going to talk about uh, all our top 10 related to mobile application. Then demo, then we can take your QA. Um, this is a disclaimer. Um, what we actually are about to see is actually carried out for purely Educational purposes and um, and only for intended audience of responsible individual with a genuine interest in improving the security of mobile application. Digital Encode actually have no claim as to the accuracy or completion of this demo, and Digital Encode has no responsibility or reliability arise from this demo. So please, I hope we all understand this disclaimer. All right. Um, so um, introduction. Um, 2009, actually, there's actually an increase in um, reported vulnerabilities on mobile application. Why? Because before 2009, most of the phones we are using are actually not a smartphone. But when the likes of smartphones started coming in, that is when the, there are increase in reported vulnerability on the mobile application. And what caused this? The majority of the mobile phones we are using now even have, they are more powerful than most of the system laptop that people are using. You can do a lot of things with mobile phone, and those are the things, the way those mobile phones are becoming like a normal, car, the way vulnerability actually keep coming in on those mobile devices. And um, why mobile applications are more vulnerable, and they can be hacked very easily. 
Number one thing is um, development is actually focused on features, functionality, and the appearance and security. Majority of the application we have seen so far, what um, the management or the organization is all about is, oh, okay, is the application functioning? Is it okay? Is it fine? What's the appearance? What they feel like? Uh, how the customer can see this? Is it beautiful? And they forget about the security of that application. And uh, most of the time, too, developers are not aware of what they call a secure quality standard. Um, I've seen a scenario whereby we saw a vulnerability on the application and the developer will tell you, no, it's not possible. How, how do you tell me this application is possible? And until when you're not demo, you show the developer how this vulnerability can be achieved. That's when the developer will say, oh, okay, truly, this is actually a vulnerability. I've seen a scenario, let me use um, a mobile banking, for example. Logically, um, there's a vulnerability that common that we always discover on the mobile bank, especially, let me use internet banking, for example, for mobile banking, whereby maybe I want to transfer from uh, my account to someone else's account. Conventionally, um, I'm supposed to transfer from my account to that person's account, and they will debit me and credit the person. But because of the um, majority of those um, developers, they are not aware, they, are not, they don't know what we call a managed the middle attack. So they trust the user so much, whereby they do what we call a client-side validation. And what is a client-side validation? Whereby I put the control on the front end instead of the back end. So whereby when I want to transfer um, from the front end of my mobile phone, I can't swap the account because the control is there. But when I intercept in the middle, when I click transfer, I can actually use this money the middle tools, which one of the team I'm going to show you, which is called Boxit, to actually intercept and change that account number. So that from will be from the person account and two will be my account. So when I send to the server, and because the server is not validating at the server end, and it's to assume that the transaction is already coming from the person I'm transferring to, and instead of my account to be debited, my account will be debited, it will be credited. And these are the kind of vulnerability we have seen on the mobile app. And um, now, um, majority of the mobile app have not even, uh, 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 they don't develop it, um, um, how will I say it now? They don't develop it, maybe, okay, it's mobile app. Most of the application now we have, they actually uh, omnichannel. What I mean by omnichannel is, it's just a one application that someone developed, but the only thing is, they will not be converting it to, if it's a mobile app they want to convert it, they will convert it to mobile app. If it's the web, they will application, you will discover that it's the same vulnerability that will be on your mobile app. I've seen an application whereby I want to change my um, password. And when I want to change my password, because of the, I can intercept it in the middle and see the ID that the mobile app is sending to the server, I can change that ID to another person's ID. And instead of seeing my, maybe my, see my ba balance or change my password, I'll be able to change another password. So what are the things that we see? And trust me, if um, developers are not aware of this thing, most of the time developers will agree with you, all these things are not possible is until you show them, you let them understand this thing, you put them through the process, that's why they can say, oh, okay, this is actually a vulnerability that can happen. And the last one is the user awareness. Um, I think um, majority of the user are not aware of what can go wrong when we talk about mobile um, vulnerability. Um, Organizations are not do enough awareness. Um, I always tell people when I do training that, okay, um, and I will use financial institution for example i know financial institutions send them um, uh, awareness via email to all their customers um, and if you have maybe you have ten thousand customers out of that ten thousand customers trust me it may be one thousand of them that have email address even if the, the one thousand of them that have email address maybe 200 is the one that checking their mail 800 of them does not even check in their mail so it will go a long way if maybe once in a while bank can um, send awareness to customer via text message People will be forced, if I see a test message from my bank, I'll be forced to open that test message because I will thought it's a debit alert. And doing so, you actually cause across a lot of people when you talk to, uh, when it comes to security awareness. So um, evolution of first scenario, um, gone are the days whereby the only thing we know about uh, fraud related to mobile is, um, we call it freaking fraud, whereby you make free calls. I remember those CHI, um, that box and you have to buy a card and they'll tell you before your units expire, you can quickly take that card and put it inside the freezer and also put it inside the freezer 
you have more units. I don't know how to use it anyway. But people have started making free calls based on all those things. And now we move to what we call the vision. Vision is someone trying to call you, trying to get information from you very call. But now we have not have something that is more neighbor sophisticated now because majority of our platform now moving to um, digital now. Now you, 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 I can be in the comfort of my house. I'm, I'm assessing my mobile banking. And I can be in the comfort of my house and assessing other application because uh, the, the control, the total control now is now with the, with the client. So it's like you, the, the client are now the king because I can do and undo. I don't need to go to the bank or go to, 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 the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to your own environment to do a lot of things now. Because of the mobile application, I can initiate anything I want to do. And I can be in another country too and do a lot of things. That's why fraud are actually very common when we talk about um, all this deal, when you talk about digital channel, because I can be anywhere in the world and try to commit a, a, a lot of fraud. And um, mobile devices are about trades. Um, this is a report that came up um, from um, Google Play Low in July 2019. And they grew a did a review and they, they said that um, majority of the app that we even downloaded on Google Play has vulnerability. And a lot of um, number of apps that have hidden ads on um, Google Play, they rated it as 188. As at that time, you can imagine what the number is going to be now. And the number of people that have been studying is um, 19 million plus. For suspicion scam, they have three half on Google Play and 12 million has actually downloaded a half. That's the same thing with ad fraud, fake app, fake antivirus, ad red dropper, back, um, backdoor. And um, people are downloading these things. And people are actually downloading this app, and which is make a majority of people if, um, vulnerable to all this kind of attack. I can see, imagine there's some application you need to download and those applications will tell you they want to access your contact, they want to access this, they want to access that. And of which we'll be wondering, um, this application does actually don't need this access to actually do what it's supposed to do. But most of the time, if you don't give those application access, you won't be able to use some of this application. That's why we have the likes of people talking about TikTok now that um, China is using for, to get data for people and so on and so forth. So when we talk about mobile devices and broad tricks, um, um, one of the things that can happen to your uh, attack is um, ransomware. Um, people think ransomware can only affect um, laptop alone. Affect your mobile devices too. You can download any app and before you know it, um, they will encrypt your data. Um, sometimes you can even um, try to, uh, maybe try to visit a site and before you know it, you'll see your phone actually so um, if we're doing overheating and you've been wondering what do you do not open so many app and of which they're using your phone to do mining of Bitcoin sometimes they use because of the sites that you we visited. Then phishing, in fact, phishing is, is easier to do phishing for people on mobile phone because the way the email is going to come sometimes it may not allow you to even see maybe the header or those things that you can see on a conventional laptop. So phishing is easier on mobile phone. Definitely malicious app too. We have so many malicious apps. And it's so funny that um, even on um, Google, Play, um, Google App Store today, I can have, maybe the name of my app is A. I can, so another person can develop an application called A too. So we can. But the only thing that will be different is um, ID. But most of the clients, most of the user, head user, we don't check uh, ID. What I just go to, maybe I just want to download your app and your app is ABC. I just go on the, uh, Apple Play Store and just try for okay ABC and when I see the ABC I just downloaded it I don't even look at whether it's a malicious app or not which is 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 one big um, majority of the issue that we have is actually related to Android I know um, Apple actually tried to do a lot of um, um, how would I say it now to put a lot of security in place to check to do all those things but Play Store I don't think um, Play Store has all those check in place. Then data leakage too is one of the things that can affect mobile devices. Then also secure Wi-Fi. Um, we've seen a lot of things whereby people go to, we can travel out or you go to public places whereby you try to enter your mobile banking and using a free Wi-Fi and where someone can actually save that network because you don't know how the mobile Wi-Fi is actually um, uh, set up. 
And um, if you are using the HTTP, maybe the app, app service, you even surfing in all those API via HTTP. It's even easier for someone to sniff. But if you're using an HTTPS, definitely it's going to be a little bit beautiful. But trust me, there's something we call a ARP poisoning, whereby um, what the attacker just needs to do is to just poison the network and it will pop up on your phone like a certificate for you to accept. Once you accept it, whether you're going to HTTPS, I'm going to see what it's going to, you're, you're passing to because um, it has graduated the normal HTTPS that the application is using. And um, I'm now be the one that now served the application over the HTTP. So it's using my own certificate now instead of using the other certificate. Then broken to be cryptography so is one of the issues. Um, I've seen an application whereby um, we found an issue, maybe for example, um, I want to buy something on e-commerce um, and when I want to buy, and instead of paying the, maybe I'm supposed to pay, I initiate the platform on my mobile phone, um, I intercept, maybe I'm supposed to pay 20,000 and when I intercept it, I, I can pay less than it because they are not doing server validation, the transaction is successful. So the merchant got back and said they have fixed it. And what they did is they encrypt the amount. And once they encrypt the amount, uh, they said they have fixed it and I, we need to test it back. And when I'm testing it back, so I, I noticed that they encrypt the amount. In fact, this time around, they use a stronger encryption whereby you cannot you take your time for you to break it. So what I did is I, know, I noticed that um, maybe I want to buy something of 50,000 and um, I want to pay less, but I cannot pay less because they keep the amount. So what I do is I will go to the platform again and maybe I want to pay something um, of 10,000. So I will look for a product that's worth of 10,000. Look for it, I will initiate the transaction. Then I'll, I know that we encrypt that 10,000. So I'll copy the encryption and I go back to, come back to the one that you encrypt with um, 50,000 initial um, payment, map, what's it called? My initial transaction, then I'll copy that encryption of the 10,000 and replace it with that 50,000. Then I'll send it to the, to the server. Since it's your encryption, definitely trust me, that kind of um, application vulnerability is going to go through. So I always advise people when you're doing encryption, try as much as possible, you encrypt the whole payload and try to encrypt uh, maybe the date, the time of transaction so that even if I try to replay that kind of encryption, something will have changed. The application will be intelligent enough to say that, oh, no, 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 maybe the, the hash value have changed, something have changed because date and time will not be the same thing when I'm replaying it. So, um, but if not, trust me, um, we, we, people will be able to decrypt your application. Or you are, say you are doing encryption, you are using base 64 encryption, which, so that's the kind of issues that actually come when I talk about mobile devices related to cyber attack. So now um, let's move to mobile application security management life cycle. All these stages are very important from development stage, testing page, production, we did an update, if there's needs to be an update. Um, definitely if the application is not in use again, people try to remove the application, then people try to delete them the application. This last stage actually not common, but the development stage, if I, this is the key aspect. If you miss it from the development stage, it's, it's, it's actually going to take the of God before you know that something is going on because you can even see a lot of things that happen before you even notice that, oh, you have actually recorded a fraud before um, you can see anything. And um, why people miss it at the development stage, which we have mentioned earlier is, when you want to do, develop an application, a mobile application, for example, uh, definitely there will be what the business needs. What are the business needs for you to develop that application? And when you are doing that business, you gather the requirements together. When you are gathering the requirements together, there's one key thing that is missing, which is the security requirements. People don't consider the security requirement when they are gathering the requirements. We call it requirement definition. The security aspect of it is taken out. So people think, okay, when we develop it and we test it, when we move to production, we can now do um, security aspect, we can test for security. In fact, sometimes people, even in production, when they are on, when they say they test, when they are doing their, um, their testing, what they just test for is even the security people, they test for 
um, the functionality aspect alone. They will tell you, okay, uh, is this application running via HTTPS? Is running via HTTPS? They will check it. How do you ensure that even this application is running via HTTPS? I've seen an application whereby that certificate alone, the HTTPS, is just for login page that the HTTPS, this application is running via HTTPS. If you intercept other things that the application is doing after you're blogging, everything is served by HTTP. But because people, when you see the certificate and you see that padlock, ah, people assume, oh, okay, this application is running on HTTPS and they think the application is even secure. Nobody can intercept my application. And I always tell people, your HTTPS does not affect a vulnerability related to application vulnerability. Your HTTPS is just addressing a network vulnerability, network layer vulnerability, let me put it that way. And what does that mean by network? Network layer vulnerability. I already mentioned it um, earlier that um, if you're going to your mobile application, maybe you want to log in or you also use your mobile application, and you are using a, 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 a network, maybe an internet that attacker 2 is using, maybe you see one public Wi Fi that everybody is using. If you are going to HTTPS, if the attacker is sniffing, it will be difficult for the attacker to see what is going on. Unless the attacker now do what we call that ARP poisoning, whereby I send you something and you accept my own certificate, that is when you are gone. But if you don't accept that certificate that the attacker is sending to you, if you are on that same network with the attacker, trust me, you are still okay. But if you, the application is, that's what the HTTPS is doing at the network layer. But at the application layer, if I use my username and password, that HTTPS does not encrypt your username and password. Because people think, oh, because I'm using HTTPS, all my transmission is encrypted. No, the HTTPS does not, encrypt your transmission when I use my username and my password and think the HTTPS encrypt those username and password. No. But the HTTPS encrypt the application and the network layer, whereby people on the same network with you may not be able to see what is going on unless they do that ARP poisoning or they save the network and you accept their own certificate. So um, then the testing phase, um, you need to test and this phase too, you actually need to test for security has to go along the next phase, even when you get to production. And when you make any updates, maybe you make any changes, you add a new module, you need to ensure that you test too, so that you will be ensured that the new module you had to that application does not introduce a vulnerability to that application. Because most of the time, when we it, um, just do the updates, so we think, oh, because we, we have done the security testing, we do venture testing on the app before we deploy to production. So when we just did update, we don't need to do it again. No, most of the time that vulnerability, a new vulnerability can be introduced because of the update that you did. In fact, most of the time, what most of the majority of the things that is even important that after seeing the people will explain that there's a fraud and they will not be wondering what's changed. And they will not be say, okay, let's look at the change management. You will, you will not even be able to see what actually changed, who make the change, what changes they make. There's no change management, proper change management in place, which is one of the key things that is supposed to be in place for any organization. Then app remover, in case there's any need to be, maybe there's um, some application that's supposed to be obsolete and people need to uninstall that app. I've seen the application whereby you install it. You have to ensure that if people uninstall the application, everything about the application on the phone will, will be uninstalled totally. The same thing with app deletion, so that there won't be any traces. Maybe your application is not, um, your phone is not capturing anything or you're not storing any local database on the phone whereby even if you install the application, the database too is still residing on the application and anybody that have access to that, uh, that phone will be able to see those kind of things. Yeah, so this is the main thing. That's our top 10, the way we have for web application, we have the same thing for mobile applications too. Uh, this is a 2016, this is the new update as a 2016. There's one for 2014, but this is the new update for 2016. And the first thing on the OAuth testing for mobile application is um, e-proper platform usage. And what does this thing mean? This one means is um, majority of the developer are making use of security feature on the phone. That is what they are using for their mobile application, which some of the time is wrong. Sometimes um, people, most of the application use them, uh, maybe I want to use Touch ID, you'll be able to use um, your biometric eye, eye scanner for you to just log into your mobile application. Um, something happened to me last, last year. Um, well, I'm actually, I'm testing one application and um, because my wife, I've, um, I've already enrolled my wife to have access to my phone where uh, my touch ID. And then when I want to enroll for that mobile application, 
I actually put um, my I in, initiate enable touch ID too. But just um, call my wife that she should just come and try a uh, fingerprint on that mobile application. And behold, she actually logged into my mobile application. I was, and I'm wondering, is it supposed to be that way? So that means everybody that have access or have enrolled their fingerprint on my mobile phone will automatically have access to my mobile application. That's what is me, which is not supposed to be that way. The same thing with uh, maybe you're using uh, Face ID too. That means everybody that have access to use Face ID to unlock your phone, we automatically have access to your mobile application when you're using the Face ID, which is not supposed to be. It's supposed to be able to be um, application be generated in over by is when I'm enrolling for to use Face ID, it's only my own Face ID it's supposed to go in. Not that it will look at the phone and see, okay, because this guy have a something on face ID on my phone, I should be able to log in to my phone, that I mean, to my mobile app directly, which are the, some of the key things. The same thing with the keychain on for iOS. Majority of the applications store, um, conventional stuff on, on, on the keychain, which anybody that have access to that phone, do maybe do some forensic analysis or check out those keychain, will be able to see my, maybe sometimes my username, my, my password, because they are storing it. So that the things that um, this um, OR Thurston number one is uh, actually addressing, so the second one is insecure data storage. Um, majority of the application actually store some confidential information on um, local DB of the phone. Some store your username, some store your password, so that each time, maybe because of the network failure, for you to just go to the server to authenticate, when you try to log in, it authenticates you locally first. So when there's a network, you just now go ahead and just authenticate to the server which most of the time is wrong. And most of the people don't encrypt those data so that if I have access to that phone and I can just copy out the SPL light of that database of the phone, I'll be able to see all those details. Some people say they encrypt it and they are using a, a kind of um, base 64 encryption for it to, to, to encrypt all those data, which, which are, are not okay. Then the next one is um, um, insecure communication. Um, some application are using um, so some communication secure, um, maybe they serve most of the IP via HTTP set of HTTPS. Some, um, some application use um, you know, SSL v3 now to serve all, all those things instead of TLS 1.2 now. So that's the kind of things that we need to be addressed on this. Then it's secure authentication too. Majority of the application, we can actually bypass the authentication. Um, what you just need to do is um, when you intercept, maybe I'm trying to log into my, to my own account. And um, when I'm trying to intercept and I intercept, Logging in, what I just do to do is to just if I know anybody user ID and I just put that user ID there. Most of the applications they don't validate password. What they validate is on the check. Oh, is the user ID okay? They just check on the database, look for the user ID and log you in. So if I remove that password from the application, most of the application I've tested over the years. But I can see your password of the application I've tested over the years. You can delete that password feed and they will log you in up with that on that application using that username, once they see that the username is correct, they'll so just log in. So which are some of the things that um, so you, 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 you need to look at for. There's some things too, uh, whereby what I just need to do is maybe there's an admin page and as I log in uh, on, on my own platform and I just do slash admin, I will just force that um, browser, we call it for, for boot force attack. So force the browser to just give me the page of that admin page using my own authentication. Validate that okay, does this guy have access to log into the admin page? If not, it should bounce me back. But most of the application, what they just check is okay, does this page exist? That's what they just check. Once they check the page exists, they give me access to, to that page. Um, or some application that I have maybe input an authorizer. I've seen an application whereby I can input at the same time I can approve. What I just need to do is sometimes most of the things there are um there are URL changes, maybe the input are supposed to be slash input. And when you look at the URL of the approver, you'll see maybe slash approve. So what you just need to do is when you log in as an inputter and you input whatever you want to put, just on your URL while you still log in, just do slash approve, put it there and you click, um, you refresh the page. Most of the time you have access to that page to approve, which you're not supposed to be. Then um, insufficient cryptography. This is people using a weak encryption. Um, they're using base 64, even MD5 sometimes. Um, and they think they're encrypted and they, they will tell you how we have encrypt, encrypted the data. No, can have access to it. Trust me, 
to to decrypt that is very easy to to, to decrypt. In fact, I always to use this scenario. To be honest with you, there's actually no kind of encryption that cannot de be decrypted. The only thing is the time that it's going to take the person to to decrypt that um, encryption. Is like I have your ATM. If I have your ATM card and um, there's some logic that I need to follow, I know that um, for your ATM card, I have four pin, and um, I can only try three times in a day. So the only thing I will do is the first day I will try 0000, 0001, 0002. But if I'm, that's why we recommend that you use a stronger picture. If I'm lucky enough, you are the kind of person that just use a weak number, maybe 0001. That means in the first day, I will have access to your, <laughs> to your account using your ATM card. But if you are the kind of person that use 9999, before I get to that one, in fact, your ATM card, that I cannot crack that encryption. But the only thing, is, it can take me years, which does not make sense for me to crack that encryption. That's why people recommend that you should use a strong vision, alphanumeric, even when it comes to password too. Use a family so that by the time the hacker wants to even try to crack that encryption, it take years and which does not make sense for the hackers. Then um, the same thing with the authorization too. Insecure authorization, most of the application lack those one too. Then poor code quality. You will see some application that um, their code quality is, is actually you no-no. Know, <laughs> when you look at it, maybe the version of the uh, application, the um, code they are using, they are still using some old version, the conventional way that we are coding in 1957. That's what um, some application are still using, whereby it's easier for someone. There's some application when I look at what kind of um, code that they are using, I know some vulnerability that I can see on that application by default. So that's actually what this one is talking about. This is um, someone trying to do the man in the middle, try to change a lot of things, response code sometimes. In fact, um, majority of the thing happened to some um, Merchant, so when you are, if you are a merchant and maybe someone needs to buy something on your platform, you send, you bid up a transaction, you send to the payment gateway. Sometimes, most of the thing that the merchant wants to see whether the transaction is successful or not. So, what most of the hackers do is, um, if I initiate that thing from your mobile application and um, I will initiate a successful transaction so that I'll be able to see what kind of investment code that is coming back to the merchant, then I will now go back and do a malicious transaction whereby when it's coming, you know, um. And the payment gets away, they can, the payment they can block it and say, that, oh, okay, this transaction is not successful. But when it's coming back to the merchant, I'll just change the successful, um, um, this successful code to successful code. And just change your code. And the merchant will see it as a successful um, transaction. So that when they're not doing the reconciliation, that's where the problem will happen. And um, that's what one is talking about. Then reverse engineering. This is where people take your code on the Play Store and they dimension your code, um, try to build up your code look at your code and see the way your code is, is so that they can understand what you put in place. That's why we recommend that what we call obfuscation. A majority of the um, mobile application, um, either APK or iOS, or don't, they are not obfuscating their code. What obfuscation does is, even if I decompile your code, I won't be able to see that um, code in a clear test that I will be able to understand. But because you are not obfuscating that code, if I can decompile your code, I understand all those things that um, your code is doing, which API, which API is sending it to. I can do two things. One, I can build another application that will look at your code because I understand the pattern of your code now. Then I will put it on um, a what we call a Google Play Store and people will download it and think maybe it's your legitimate code. Something you'll notice that some people have quite some credentials whereby they may be the creature to connect to your API, all those kind of things. On the source code, on the code of that application, whereby when I decompile it, I'll be able to see all those things, which my colleague is going to show you how people do all those things, reverse engineering and see all those things. Then um, the last one is the external functionality. There's some application whereby um, there's some functions that are not required at that particular time. Maybe when they are doing the development stage, the developer just trying to put on, on the code, try to put an API to call a, a, um, a maybe admin page because so that for him to just remember or do something. But when they not deploy that application to production, they don't need that functionality to happen again. But because most of them, because developer forget, so they still have coded, put that functionality in that code and put it to production. So anybody that downloads the application, that they compile the code and see that functionality and say, oh, okay, this is the thing that you can call it for, for you 
this admin page for you to assign a function that is not required on the application presently, which you're not supposed to do. So we have to make sure that all the functions that are not required on the application presently are not enabled or are not accorded in the code of the application. So that it is that you need to, the OAS top 10 is actually talking about. Then this thing is very important. Um, any application can actually be digitally evaded if they are missing this thing. Um, we actually call it ADU. Um, um, what ADU means is the architecture of the application is very important. The design, the implementation, and the operation. In fact, this operation is one of the key. Um, we call something a business logic test. Business logic test means um, for me to understand, I first understand the application, and once I understand the application, I'm trying to bypass the logic of the application. Maybe the application is supposed to be do ABC. And I will, I will now say, okay, since the application is doing ABC, can I put a code there? Or can I bypass the control that you put in place so that application can do ABCD? So that kind of things that we check. That's why I, I talk about um, internet banking, someone shop an account. Instead of my account to be debited, I will be credited. Or someone puts a negative value. Maybe I want to transfer um, 20, I mean, 200,000 to someone. And you know, when I want to put 200,000 on the amount fees, the application will not allow me to put minus 200,000. If you put minus 200,000, will tell me the, the amount cannot be greater than, that will be less than zero. But when I set, I can introduce that minus there. And when I send it to the server, and your server is not doing what we call a server-side validation. Trust me, the server will just consume it as an action. And when it gets to your, uh, to your, uh, to your server, and it interprets it minus times minus, so that will be, minus 200,000 times minus, and it will become plus. And that means I'm manufacturing two, an additional 200,000 to my back account automatically if I introduce a negative value to it, which we have seen application reacting to this, to this kind of scenario. So there's a lot of things, especially when we talk about uh, business logic. Business logic um, is even the main thing, to be honest with you, because um, sometimes, you need to think outside the box, which most of the things my colleagues is going to show you. You need to think outside the box of business logic. Sometimes when you're doing a business logic test, um, you can't just upload your um, mobile application, maybe the APK or the iOS to, to scan and just scan and will tell you you can swap account. No, it's, it's for you to manually do all those things. In fact, it's, you manually do simulate all those kind of attack and see whether they are vulnerable to kind of attack or not. So um, we'll move to the practical demo now. Um, so um, which my colleague is going to take, um, like I said, this is um, still the disclaimer that what you're about to see, you have to, we are not taking no responsibility or liability for this demo. I will take the section. Okay. Um, thank you, Femi. Um, Good morning once again. Um, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. If you can't, just um, just drop a question in the Q and A session or a comment in the Q and A um, um, part of this presentation. Okay, so I'm going to be you know demonstrating a couple of um, things that we do on a daily basis. Um, you know, in terms of testing mobile applications and you know mobile application security in general. Um, just give me a second, let me pull up my screen. Um, let me just make sure, can you see this? To be sure everyone- Yes, I can see your screen, yes. Okay, all right. I can see your screen, yes. Okay, so I mean, this is um, basically the setup. I'm going to be explaining um, this in a bit, but before I do that, I just want to give a, uh, a background to, you know, um, some methods used in doing, um, uh, you know, application security testing. Um, broadly, um, there are two categories. You have the dynamic application security testing, which is, you know, what, we, is known as DAST, and we also have the static application, you know, security testing um, uh, method as well, which is known as the SAST. You know, both of them are not um, exactly mutually exclusive, meaning that, I mean, 
doing one doesn't eliminate the need to do the other. You know, so both of them can actually still be done. But what we're going to be doing today um, falls in line with the dynamic application security testing. You know, that is just basically when you're testing the application, you know, as it is being operated. Static application security testing involves you, you know, doing things around the lines of code review and reviewing the application codes for, you know, um, um, for the security vulnerabilities or, you know, um, weak programming techniques and all that. You know, so what we're doing today is majorly business logic, and we consider this as very important because, um, as it is today, um, the only tools that can effectively run this type of assessments are humans. Why do I say humans? Humans are the ones that can actually um, have the ability to think critically and uh, you know, devise means to beat um, applications logic. I'll show you what I mean um, shortly. So um, this is just my setup. I have Bob Suit here. Um, this is a freely available tool which can be downloaded online, although there's a professional version. But for uh, you know, the, the training purposes for today, this can be, um, this can suffice. And I also have uh, my emulator here. Um, this is basically um, an Android phone, which has a vulnerable mobile app. They call it WATF Bank. I think it means what a terrible financial banking app or something, but it's, it's delib deliberately vulnerable. It is um, available on GitHub. And perhaps after this session, you can go there, download it and also, you know, try to practice around with it if you, if you so wish. Um, and of course, you know, say for example, you have a mobile app on your phone called ABC Bank, right? You log on to the ABC Bank and you see your balance. The act of logging on and seeing your balance, you know, and all that, there is definitely an application server somewhere in the ABC Bank that is supplying those details, you know, through the mobile application on your phone and allowing you to see those details. So same thing like this, that's why you see this IP here. This is the backend server of this mobile application, you know, hosted somewhere in, um, in, my, in my house. So um, when I log in, when I put my username and password, you know, and all that, it goes to the server, the server validates and brings back, you know, whatever it's supposed to bring back. And these are just, um, this notepad here has some credentials that I can use to log on to the, to the platform. So as a value add, I just want to, you know, quickly show, you know, you guys how to set up your Bob suits or your application, um, your, your, yeah, your Bob suits community edition for testing um, mobile apps and how to also prep your mobile phone to be able to, um, uh, you know, have its traffic intercepted by Bobsuit. Basically, oh yeah, I haven't mentioned, what Bobsuit does is, Bobsuit, um, it basically does a man in the middle. It sits between your application clients and of course the um, application server. So basically you have your application um, clients, that is your mobile app on your phone on the right hand, or rather on the left hand, you have your application server on the right hand, you know, what you have in between two of them is um, um, a man in the middle tool called Bobsuit. So what Bobsuit will help you do is it will help you inspect, analyze, uh, you can even update, you know, do anything to any traffic coming from the application server that is going to the um, client or coming from the client and going to the application server. So I'll show you how that, you know, is achieved here shortly as well. So um, this is what Bob suit looks like. First and foremost, let me just close it and start it again. So basically, this is what you see when you start up Popsuit. Um, 
just the preambles. Obviously, um, community edition won't give you the option to create projects or open existing projects. So you just have to, you know, move on with the temporary project. And of course, using Bob, Bob's default configuration. So that means that anytime you set up, anytime you restart this Bob's application, you would have to, you know, implement or do whatever configurations that you're doing, that we're going to be doing inside. But it's pretty straightforward, you know, once you get the hang of it in 30 seconds, it's something that you can easily set up. So um, I'm going to give a brief description of some of the tabs. The tabs are, you know, dashboard, targets, proxy, you know, and the likes. What we're going to be using mostly is proxy, um, repeater, and, you know, intruder. Um, so for proxy, proxy is basically the um, module that handles the actual man in the mid lane. So basically proxy is what, you know, you have to set up to, um, in proxy, you have to set up a listening port, you know, and all that, and, you know, also other settings to guide how Bobsuit intercepts, uh, you know, traffic from applications and responses from servers. So how we set that up is we click on proxy, we go to options, Um, I'm hoping most of us have uh, maybe notes and, um, and pens so that we can just take some pins down so that you can, you know, practice at a later time. So now um, the first section we see proxy listener. So this is very important. I have to set up a listener to ensure that my phone can communicate with my BOP on my system, the BOP on my system. How do I do that? I just go to add listener. And you see bind ports. I have to define a port I want, you know, my phone and my pop suit to be communicating over. So I just type one, two, three, four. Any random port will do. I mean, from the standard port range. You could use nine 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 nine, you could use five zero 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 zero, you know, anything really would actually, you know, uh, work. So I choose to use one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And I have to bind to all interfaces. So give me this um, prompt. I just move on with it and that's fine. So you can see the first column here signifies running. So it means if you have it ticked, it's going to be running. If you untick it, you know, you stop that proxy listener from running. So I'm going to untick the default one and I'm going to leave only my, um, the one I want to set up for my phone to run. So yeah, I have now su um, successfully, you know, set up my pop proxy listener. What do I do next? I move on to um, intercept client requests. So here is just basically a um, setting for Bob Suits to understand how you want it to handle um, clients' requests. Same thing for the one under intercept server responses. You know, you have to set it up appropriately. By default, the default configuration of Bob comes with this checked. That is intercepting requests based on, you know, the following rules in the, in the box below. So it's always checked by default. But the one for intercept, intercepting server responses is not checked by default, so you have to check it. This is very, very important because if you don't check this box, you will not be able to, so say for example, I want to change my password or, yes, I want to change my password or I, I'm trying to log in. And when I impute my username and password and I press sign in, the client's request will be caught by Bob Suit. Right, but the server response, say for example, I put in a wrong password. If I don't check this option here, that response from the server saying that, ah, Mr. Oga, you have supplied a wrong username and or password or whatever it is, I will not be able to see it on Bob Suits. And this is actually important for you know testers because um, they are able to use 
those responses to actually analyze, you know, do some analysis on how the application responds to certain inputs. It is very, very important, you know, to do that. So after doing that, I don't want it to um, intercept based on any specific rule. So I want it to just intercept everything. So I uncheck the first two um, boxes, the first two check boxes in the, in the box that is just under the broad rule of the intercept client requests and the intercept server responses as well. I uncheck both of them. So I've set up my proxy uh, in an appropriate way. Um, so now let's go over to our mobile device. Now, naturally, uh, let me show you what. Let me just try to log on first. So I hope we can all see what is on the screen. Right now, we can see that this is a post request going to the server. And you can see the details I just supplied, the username and the password. I release that request and it is going, it has gone to the server and the server is giving me a response. You can see um, it's giving me a successful response. It has said that it has accepted my username and password, you know, and all as well. But I think it has timed out on the application, so it won't give me the next screen. But let me impute a wrong password so you see what the request and response looks like. So now I'm supplying the same thing. This is the request payload. So basically, this is Bobsuit proxy has two modes intercept on and intercept off. When the intercept is on, it's actually, you know, preventing anything from passing through it. So it's just going to accept whatever uh, request payload or uh, um, response from the server and hold it in its own environment, right? Until you either fall the traffic or turn off intercepts. So that is what this intercept is for. Um, let me just expand the screen a bit more so you see. So you can see intercept on, intercept on. It's something that you can toggle on or off. Forward is, you know, like I said, if one, once your intercept is on, you know, you have to now start forwarding traffic because Bob's will be holding everything that comes its way. So you have to keep, you know, forward, click forward, if it's a traffic that you don't want to inspect, you have to click forward so that it moves on to, you know, the server. Um, it moves on to the server that, you know, is meant to communicate with. So, um, this is a wrong password I've supplied here. So when I click login, you can see the payload for um, sending the request to the server. Now you can see the response saying that the password is invalid. So that is, you know, why uh, the option right here, that's why you actually have to click, you know, enable this server response. You know, I just wanted to, you know, show you that before we move ahead. So the next thing I want to show you is actually how to set up the, um, how to set up your phone for intercepting um, or for, you know, forwarding traffic to bots proxy. The first rule is the laptop that you're using to test, the laptop that you have or the system or workstation or whatever you have that you have installed Bob's on must be on the same physical network with your mobile device. So if you are using a mobile phone, a live mobile phone, all well and good. What must happen is you must have maybe perhaps a Wi-Fi dongle or whatever it is. You must have the laptop, the system, whatever it is connected to that network. You must have your mobile device as well 
connected to that same network, you know, for seamless testing. Why is this? Because we are going to be setting up um, our laptop as a proxy channel for our mobile device. You know, I'm sure, you know, a lot of us here work in banks and, and, and the likes. We all know, you know, what a proxy server is, where it sends all our requests to before, you know, the proxy server pushes that request to the, um, you know, to the internet and, you know, it facilitates all that. So th this is somehow, you know, that's the kind of setup that we're going to be, you know, achieving um, 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 here. So what is going to happen now is I'm going to get the IP of my um, laptop. config. You can see my IP is 192.168.8.106. I take a mental note of that. So now I have to go to my Wi-Fi settings on my phone. I hold uh, the network I'm connected to down and I click on modify network. Now I have already set this up, you know, prior to this session, but let me assume that we're starting all over again. There's always an option for proxy settings, you know, I, I think in all phones, even on Apple phones, on iPhones, Android phones, this is an Android phone, as you can see. So there's always a setting for proxy setting, which is, you know, always off. So for the purpose of testing, you have to actually come and you know, enable it, put it on manual. In the proxy hostname tab, you put the IP of your laptop, which is this. You must put the IP of your laptop there. Then in the proxy ports, you have to ensure that you put the same ports that you have configured on BOP. Remember when we said this proxy listener port? Yes, this is where we have to use it. So this, once I save this, this would now make my laptop and the Bob suit on my laptop um, become the proxy server for my phone. This means that anything that my phone, any HTTP traffic that my phone is trying to send to anywhere, be it the internet or be it to another you know, device on my network or whatever it's, you know, any HTTP traffic, it has to go through Bob. This is the summary of you know the configuration I have just you know set up here. So that is why you know we're able to see the initial you know request and response uh, you know for when I was trying to log in. You understand. So now that I've set that up, another thing is very important. Um, I actually have to install Bob Suits certificates on my phone. Why is that? If I don't install BobSus certificates, I will not be able to access sites that are, you know, um, that are on HTTPS because it's going to be um, seeing the traffic as something strange because the certificate has not been installed on the device that is, you know, requesting that service or whatever. So I actually have to install the certificate. And how do I do that? I just come to my browser on my phone. Then I navigate to the IP and the port I just configured in my Wi Fi settings 192.168.8.106.1234. Uh, right. If you've set up your Bob suits properly and your Android device properly or your mobile phone properly, you should be getting something like this on your screen, on your browser. So if you've done this, you are you know, almost there in the setup. So what do I do? I click on this CA certificate. And it downloads the certificate of Bob onto my device. The next thing I have to do is I have to go and install this certificate. So it becomes one of the native certificates 
or not native, it becomes one of the you know user certificates that you know um, my device would start using. So it should be somewhere in downloads. Um, I actually have already downloaded a couple of them, but you know definitely you see it as ca set dot der. You know this one two three are same because I have downloaded you know a couple a couple of them. You know trying to set up for this. So naturally it should be something like this ca ca set dot der. So now depending on the device, it could be. Um, um, I've seen, I've actually seen that different devices. So for some devices, they can actually, you can actually install the certificate right from the file manager. So for my device, I can install the certificate directly from here. I just go, you know, double click on it. And it asks me for name and I install it. So you can see the certificate is installed. But for some other devices, you will actually have to change the extension, the file extension name to .cer. So you have to, you know, maybe um, click on it and look for a way to modify the name and change the file extension before you'll be able to actually, you know, install the certificate. So it depends. I mean, if you're using a device, um, you download the Bob certificate, you come here and you try to install it. If it doesn't run, then you know you know that you have to change the extension to .cr. So one of them definitely would 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 actually would, would eventually run. So after doing that, um, you're pretty much all um, you're pretty much um, all set up. So now I can effectively you know, intercept any traffic, even if the traffic is um, HTTPS or HTTP or whatever. You can see, let me go to google.com on my browser. You can see things being passed. You can see the request being made to, you know, HTTPS, www.google.com. So everything here is actually from, you know, my mobile device. Why? Because my laptop and my box suits is acting as a proxy for my mobile phone. So every request, you know, goes through um, on my, my laptop and my box proxy. So, um, you know, mobile devices have a lot of processes and a lot of things running. So usually for me, when I test, if I know the exact um, URL or the exact um, API endpoint that is my, my mobile application is calling, I can just go and add it to the scope of what I'm doing. I do that by going to targets and scope. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this to reduce the um, effect of, you know, a number of other URLs or other things, you know, disturbing my legitimate traffic. That is the traffic that I'm trying to, you know, analyze and, you know, properly test. So I know that, I know that the traffic, um, the API endpoint or the server that I'm calling is 192.168.8.103. That is what the WTF application, application you know, is calling. It cannot be anything outside that. So I just come here to add it into my scope. 192.168.8.103. I don't need to put the ports. I just leave it that way. So I've added it to my scope. So it's, I come back to proxy and edit tweak my settings and make sure that my box would only intercept requests that is from um, URLs in my target scope, which I've already set in targets. I do the same for response. So eventually it is only traffic to and from this Server, which is 192.168.8.103, that my box will be intercepting, you know, and, and, and all that. So let's move on. Um, now you can see I've captured um, this login request. Now, I'm sure we've heard of brute force, brute force, a lot of people, you know, heard of brute force, but have you actually seen one? I'm going to demonstrate what one looks like now. 
So right now I'm going to try to brute force this um, login, uh, you know, this login payload. I'm going to do that by using a module on the same box suit called Intruder. So I can just easily, you know, box it to such an intelligent tool. It allows me to just, you know, quickly send whatever traffic that I want to put first to the intruder. Now I go to the intruder tab. Everything is all set up for me. Now I have to set the kind of attack I want. I already have a word list. So I would, basically what is going to happen now is Bobsuit will run through my word lists, both for username and password, and find any matching, um, you know, patterns. Let me go get my word lists. Paste it here. Paste it here as well. <clears throat> so now that I've done this, so basically what happens is I have two payload sets. Payload one is the um, field for username, and payload two. is the field for password. So what happens is that Bobsu to run through everything here. So for every um, item here, so say for example, if Bobsu to take one, two, three, four, five as the username for the first request, then for the password is going to go to my payload two and take one, two, three, four, five as the first request. The next request will be to take username as 123456 and you know come back and take password. So it's going to run through this whole list before it moves to the next username. So it will take for the next, um, I don't know, it might be maybe count 1000 by then. For the next um, request after it has run through the initial um, list of passwords, it will come and take password as a username, then do the same thing, run through the list I have for passwords as well. Next time, it will come and take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight as the username, run through the list of, you know, this same thing as password. So um, it keeps doing that on and on. So that's why you can see the payload count is 72, the request count. So this is the number of requests that will hit my server. in doing this brute force. So I can just start attack. So it's giving me an error. Okay. So that started. So I think because it's a community version is not so swift, but I mean, you can see the counts. So it does this, you know, on and on and on and on until it can find a match. You know, naturally, it will definitely find a match that matches my username and password combination. So out of everything here, you can see this payload one signifies, if I click on anyone, you'll see what the requests and what the um, uh, response looks like. So you can see this, you can see the username. The username is one, 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 one. Password is, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, so, okay, I think this time it is actually maintaining uh, the password first, the password column first, and then running through, you know, the username. So you can just, you can keep saying how all the requests, you know, line up and, and how they are moved through. So that's basically how, you know, this works. Um, just because of time, I think we'll have to move on, you know, quickly. So we'll be able to, after this, when this is done, we'll be able to now analyze the whole, um, you know, 
attack session and see which ones actually came back with, you know, valid responses that showed, okay, message success, you know, and all that. We'll definitely see that those ones are different in length. So that is how, you know, a basic brute force attack, you know, happens. And, you know, a common way to just um, mitigate this is, you know, uh, you can implement things like, you know, account locking out, you know, such that even if a, a username is already is identified by a brute force attack, by the time it tries to run through three, four, five passwords, you know, the account of that person is, you know, automatically, you know, locked out. And also there's something they call um, device cookies. You can implement device cookies, you know, to, um, for every request that comes from maybe a mobile device, you know, things like UID or whatever it is, an identifier from the mobile device can be sent along with the request. You can request the application to, you know, get that from the phone and send it to the server. So the server logs that um, unique identifier and, you know, it's, you know, tries to do some analysis. If it's getting more than five, 10, you know, 15 requests from that particular device per time, then, you know, the application, you know, should have a logic to know that this is most likely a um, brute force attack and, you know, perhaps cut connections to that particular device that is requesting authentication. So let's um, move on to other things. So let me log into the application. So now I'm in the application. So there are a couple of things I can do. Let me turn off my intercept first so that you don't see anything. But I'm logging as Emma. Um, I can view my account summary. I can see that Emma has, uh, what is this? $1.5 million, right? Um, let me go back and let me intercept the request now. Now, I'm, I'm intercepting the request to the server to get account summary for Emma. Now, I can see that account number is being, um, you know, passed. What happens if I try to change this account number? Let's try, let's try that. So this, um, here I have a list of um, accounts. You can see one, 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 two, two. So I think they're all in 10 places. Remember, this is a test app, so that is why it, it looks, you know, a bit funny. So Emma's account is three, 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 you know, in 10 places. Now let's, 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 um, let's try and see what Michael's account balance is without, you know, obviously logging in as Michael. Remember, I'm logging as Emma. So I know that Michael's account number is um, one, 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 one in 10 places. Sorry. Account summary. Can you see what just happened? Remember that when we did the initial one, we saw that Emma had 1.5, but 1.5 million. Yeah. Now we can see that the account name is Michael and we can see his balance. To be honest, this is something that we see, you know, on the fly. Just this um, uh, broken access control is basically called is called a broken access control vulnerability where I can you know have access to um, resources that haven't been profiled for me. So you can see I can see somebody else's you know uh, account and balance his other details 
And mind you, this is a test app. This is something that is very basic. So you can imagine if it's an elaborate app, you know, maybe an app for a fintech organization or a, a banking app or, you know, something in that direction, what can happen? You, know, you can imagine the other types of information that, you know, can come along with this. It could be maybe transaction details, you know, it could be anything. And, you know, you can now start to imagine what an attacker can, you know, start making of this kind of information that he gets. And, you know, with this um, Instagram day and age where people are doing a lot of giveaways, it's, it's, I'm sure it is very easy to get people to drop their account numbers. I'm sure if I just log into Twitter now and say I'm doing a giveaway, even without stating the amount, I'm sure that, you know, like 100 people would, you know, drop their account number. So this is something that, you know, can happen. Um, now, let's see. Even if we have the account numbers, what are the things, what can we do? So now we know that Michael has $51,000. $51,000. So let me try and, you know, uh, transfer money from Michael's account to another person's account. Let's see what happens. Or oh, I'm logged in as an Emma already. Let me try and transfer from Emma's account to Michael's account since I know both of them. So transfer. So I'm transferring to Michael. Michael's account is one, 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 one in 10 places. One, two. And let me just transfer 1000 to him. So this is Emma transferring money to Michael. Click on transfer. You can see all the parameters being passed. This token here is basically like, you know, a session ID that is being tied to the current user currently logged in. But you can see the account number that the money is sending, that the money is being sent from. Two accounts is the account number the money is being sent to, and of course, 1,000 is the um, amount being sent. So when I click forward, you can see success. So let's go back and check Michael's account balance, because we don't need to log in as Michael already, because we know that we can just manipulate the request. But let me just use this opportunity to even show you, you know, another way, another uh, model on box so it's called repeater. You know, we usually use this to analyze, you know, APIs that the mobile application, API endpoints that the mobile application, you know, happens to be talking to, you know, analyze the responses, you know, we send different requests and all that. So I just sent the last request. Let me just send it to repeater. So now what this allows me to do is I can just keep sending, writing on the current session I have. Oh no, let me not use, uh, this is a login request. Let's use another request. Let's do account summary. Send to repeater. So yeah. So I can write on Emma's um, session because um, Emma already has, you know, a session token. And I can just, you know, keep using it to be getting information about accounts. So let's even ride through it and get information about um, some of the other accounts on here. So there's um, William. So without logging on to William's account, we can see that William has $10,000. Let's do for Jacob. So you can see what this repeater does. I don't even have to go to my mobile app. It just, it just gives me like, you know, a window to um, send requests and response, you know, and get responses. Something like how, uh, you know, how all this postman or um, API testing 
tools work, you know, so Bob can actually, you know, handle that for you too with this repeater model. So we're looking for Jacob. Jacob's account number is four in 10 places. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You can see that we've got some Jacob's account balance. Jacob's account balance is 200,000. So let's go back and check what Michael's account balance is. Remember, he sent 1,000, um, or rather, I think it was Emma that sent 1,000 to Michael. So let's check what Emma's account balance is right now. So you can see um, Emma's account balance has dropped by 1,000. That is 1.499 million. So now the next task is, let's see. Um, Emma has sent 1,000 to Michael. Let's see how Emma can get that 1,000 back, but without her being part of the transaction or not even without her being part of the transaction. She will definitely be on the receiving end, but let's log in as Michael and try to send Emma another 1,000, but not from his account. So do you, do you get the task? The task is I'm logging as Michael. I'm going to send money to somebody, but I don't want the money to be debited from my account. I want it to be, to be taken from somebody else's account or you know, even if the money is manufactured, let the money get to the recipient, but it shouldn't move from my account. How can we achieve that? Uh, so let's log in as Michael. Password is Michael. One, two, three. No need for us to on the intercept. Let's just log in. Check in. Let's look at account summary. So you can see that Michael has um, 52,000 because he got one through from Emma. So now I want to send money from my account as Michael, but I don't want my balance to be moved. How can I achieve that? So I try to now send the 1,000 back to Emma. I put Emma's account number. Well, now what do I do? Instead of, um, okay, I put the amount, the same amount. But remember when we you know, talked about, when we analyzed the request of the initial transfer, we saw that the account number you know, for the sender and the receiver was there. Now I know that I, me as Michael, I do not want um, the money to be debited from my account. So what do I do? I know Mr. A's account, or maybe I know uh, Jacob's account, or I know William's account. Let's use William, since he's already, you know, has the list. I know William's account number. I know his account number is 2222 in 10 places. I keep that at the back of my head. Then I go and just initiate the transfer. My Bob suit is on, my intercept is on to capture the request. Now I'm here. Two, 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 two.
apologies. It has timed out on the application already, but I will still do it from my own, um, from here. So I've implemented the transfer already, regardless of the fact that it timed out, you know, from my application's front end. So now let's go back and look at Emma's account balance. Remember, it dropped from 1.5 million to 1.4999. You can see that Emma has 150. So now let's check Michael's account because it was from Michael's account we initiated this, but we um, swapped his account number with that of William. So let's do a quick check. Go to account summary again. You can see this is a this isn't a very straightforward thing. You actually have to do a lot of you know, manipulations to get your desired results. So. so I'm checking Michael's account balance now. So you can see that Michael's account balance was 52K previously. After doing the transfer, it is still 52K. Why? Because Michael has swapped, you know, um, his account, that's the sender account number with somebody else. But I'll, it is interesting to know that if we even check, let's check Williams's account. Let's just use repeater to do that. William's account number is two in 10 places, okay. Oh, okay, this token has expired. I would have to call up another one. You can see that William's account didn't move as well. Still the same 10,000. So right now, Emma has gotten free 1,000 from God knows where, just manufactured from thin air. And, you know, the accountants at the back end would have problems, you know, during reconciliation and, you know. So these are the kind of problems that, you know, we see on, you know, a day-to-day -day basis. These are the kind of problems we see. So the 1,000 has been manufactured from, you know, from thin air. And now Emma has an extra 1,000 in her account and, you know, that's it. So another thing 
that also happens. Um, I think this should be the last thing so that we can have time for questions and answers. Okay. Let's try to see if we can, you know, send money, but a negative amount. Let's see how that will work. So I want to send some money to Emma. Um, put Emma's account. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And another one thousand. But right now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to impute minus, but I can't, you know, impute minus in this field because perhaps they've done some impute validations to ensure that you know you can't just impute any unwanted character here. But what do I have? I have Bob suits. Also, it allows me to easily edit anything. So what do I do? I just introduce the minus here. And let's see what happens. The money went through. So let's analyze account again. Let's look at the balance of uh, Emma. You can see nothing moved, but let's look at the balance of Michael. Fifty two thousand. Let me see. Something went wrong there. So basically, naturally, um, the person that is meant to uh, receive the money is actually supposed to have money deducted from his account because I was able to introduce, you know, a negative integer you know, into the traffic that is being sent to the server. So if your server, if your application, you know, on the server side is not able to, uh, you know, look at what it's receiving from the clients, you know, pass it properly and make sure that, you know, there is no um, illogical debit or credit, you'll be having, you know, issues where the receiver is getting debited and the person that is sending money you know, is getting credited. I think I mixed up something, but that's basically, you know, how that works. Another important thing I just want to show us is how easy it is to decompile, um, you know, mobile application, APKs, you know, for iOS, IPAs, you know, and the likes. So there's a tool I have called um, JADX. As you can see, I have already loaded uh, the mobile application you can see is WATF Bank. Um, this has just already decompiled the whole application for me. So I can just keep going in and, you know, looking at different things. So you can see now I can see all the, you know, methods and functions, you know, uh, you know, different classes, you know, so this obviously tells you that the code is not, you know, is not even obfuscated in any way. Because what I can do now is, I have already decompiled this code. I can just extract everything, save it somewhere, um, look for a way to re-engineer it, package it back, and, you know, go and re-upload, you know, on the Play Store. Um, like my colleague said, Femi, um, Apple makes it a bit difficult, um, you know, in terms of uploading applications to the App Store. But I mean, it, it's relatively easy for Android. That's why if you check the Android Play Store, there are a lot of applications that seem like they are duplicates. Why? Because, you know, um, let me 
same. So you can see now that I can see by virtue of me uh, decompiling the app, you know, snooping through it, I have seen, you know, a URL that logs, you know, login of users. You know, I'm not saying that every app has this, but this is something that, you know, a lot of hackers, a lot of people, you know, the, the understanding they have and they're able to uh, you know, sniff through your application, you know, just for information. Now with this information, at least I will know that I have usernames and I have account numbers. That is a start as a hacker. I know that I have usernames. So imagine this is a mobile banking app, for example. I, do, I have the, a login table, um, um, a log table of all users that have recently logged onto your app. You know, that is, you know, a serious problem. I also have the account numbers. So I can go and, you know, start, you know, stra strategically launching brute force attacks on these applications. And you never know. Customers might be using weak passwords, you know, and the likes. Let's look at, let's look for another URL that we might be able to see. Let's look at uh, account summary. If anything will come up with account summary. I think after this, that should be it. Okay, I think this is um, because this should be a post method because you're supposed to supply, you know, an account number with it. So that's why it's not actually coming over the browser. But, you know, the whole idea is you can see what I can, you know, the things that I can get from, um, you know, by just decompiling the APK and, you know, getting more information. I mean, there, there are a whole, a whole lot, you know, a whole lot of other things that, you know, we can um, show you, but, um, for the purpose of this session, I think um, we'll be stopping there so that we can take um, most of your questions. And um, I'm sure you have a number of them. I haven't been able to see all of them, but yeah, so that we can take your questions. So if you have questions, um, please just quickly drop them in the Q&A part of uh, this uh, session so that we can, we can attend to them. So thank you for listening. Um, while we answer your question. Oh, um, thank you, Ikade. Yeah. So, um, thank you, everybody. Um, I think we can answer your query now. So, um, like you said, if you have any question, please kindly drop it um, in the Q&A section so that we can address it. Um, I'm seeing the first question. I said, what's the difference between architecture and design? Uh, when it comes to application, the architecture is actually the way the application interacts with each other. When we're talking about the application architecture, um, maybe from, from the data layer, from application layer to presentation layer, uh, I can use that. Let me use this basic scenario. Maybe from the way the DB server interact with the application server, the way the application server interact with the web server, the way the web server interact with the client. So that's actually the, what they call by the architecture of that uh, application. And when I'm talking about design, it's actually talk about just the look and feel of the application, maybe how the interface of the client is supposed to be, how is it going to look like? That's what um, the design is actually talking about, the look and feel of the application. So I hope um, that one answered your question. Then um, 
I'm saying is the Bob Suit a computer software or a mobile application? It's actually a mobile, um, it's a computer software. Um, it's owned by a company called Postriga. So there's a commercial one that you can buy and there's a free one that you can buy. For the commercial one, there's more modules that you can use. But the free one, there's some modules that you cannot use. So that's, that's the way it is. So the company is called Postriga. Uh, um, I think the next one is uh, okay. if the webinar can be the video recording. Um, so I, I think that can be arranged. Um, it can be commercialized for people that need it. So, I mean, that can be discussed, you know, um, going forward. But obviously, we're going to um, give certificates of attendance you know, for this session. And also we'll be sharing the, the initial slides presented by, by Femi. So, um, so can I do you want to answer that? How do you get the IP address of the mobile application? Oh, okay. So for me, I'm using a test app, right? So a test app um, signifies that or means that I have, I'm in control of you know, the back-end server that the app is communicating with, right? So the IP address you see there on the um, app, I don't know, um, is my screen still being shared? Yes. Okay, let me just pull up the mobile device. So the IP address, if I get you correctly, this is the IP address you're talking about. This IP address is just, you know, referencing it, it, my mobile app needs to communicate with a backend server. That's why I say. But um, if I understand where you're trying to come from, your mobile apps naturally would have, you know, had the IP address or the endpoint of, you know, the IP address of the server or the endpoint or the APIs or whatever it is it needs to communicate with your back-end application already embedded in it. So all you just need to do is, you know, start intercepting it. You will be able to see where the request goes to. If you, if you look carefully here from the Bob suit, you will be able to see that let me try and just uh, initiate a, a login request. you'll be able to see that there's a request um, tag here, request to HTTPS, you know, one and two, one, six, eight, eight dot. So for your own mobile app, you would see something like this. If your bank is abcbank.com, you will see request to, uh, depending if it's using a certificate or not, you know, you will see HTTP or HTTPS slash slash bank, abcbank.com. So the endpoint that has been created for that application to communicate with, that is what you'll be seeing. You know, you'll be seeing the request and response from the server. You know, you'll be seeing all that, you know, through Bob Suit. So you don't necessarily need to, you know, maybe take this IP that I've put here in mind. It's just because this is a test app, it's a test environment, and I'm using it to just demonstrate, you know, in this, in this, um, in this session. I hope um, that answers your question. Um, can you take the next one too? Um, I all this tracing data are being saved in local, so have can have the possibility to access it later. Yeah, so um, if you are using um, Bob Suit Professional, yes, you'll be able to save all you know data that you've intercepted, the responses from the server you know, all those things, you'll be able to do that if you're using Bob's Professional. You know, I mentioned community edition, I mean, it's, it's free, so they have to restrict uh, um, some, some activities. You won't be able to do that, but um, if, if you um, um, purchase Bob's Professional, I mean, you can reach out to us, we can also assist you in that, and even give you an elaborate training on, on the whole Bob's um, environment. Um, 
you will be definitely able to to save all that and you know review at a later time. Okay, if William Balance is not saying, okay. then what is everyone not sending me a phone number? Oh, I think, okay. Um, let, me, let me let me keep in this. Okay. So um, this one, to be honest with you, the way the hackers think now is um, I don't use my account now to defraud people because I know with BVN we'll be able to trace me. Uh, maybe I'm I'm Williams. I want to defraud the system. Well, what I'll just need to do, and I know the mobile help has uh, an issue. So what I'll just do is to just call maybe one of my friends and say, please, uh, my brother or my something, please, we're going to transfer money to your account. So please, once they transfer money to your account, you withdraw it and bring it for me. So from that mobile app that's vulnerable, I will initiate that transaction the way my colleague show you, then I will transfer for that person account to that person account. So that the, when you are doing tracing and you are doing investigation, that's the person you are going to trace. So you're going to go and arrest. So that's the way those accounts did now. They don't use their own account to do malicious things because they know if they use their account, you can trace them. So that's actually why you have to make sure that your application is secure. <laughs> If you look at majority of people that are in EFCC today, majority of them don't even know, uh, they, they are not even the one that committed the, the fraud, let me even put it that way. Because someone somewhere used their account, and sometimes we have seen a scenario whereby um, they would just go to traffic people that are selling things, and they would just tell it that they want to buy something, but they don't have cash, that they have to transfer to the person and they have to follow the behavior. So they will transfer from the vulnerable mobile hub, from that person account that they are already compromised. So the person that is selling things and asking the guy to, withdraw money for them. And uh, instead of maybe they buy something of 5,000 from the guy, they can tell the guy to take 10,000 euro. So when you get yeah, the investigation, it's the innocent guy that you're going to trace. So that's actually why he showed this. Those are the things that those, those guys actually do. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Okay, next one. Uh, can we say that box it is just for testing? So, uh, so uh, if server-side validation is something that is, uh, is quite broad, <laughs> Right, um, you can't really say that box. Box it is a very, very um, massive tool. There are a lot of modules in it. You can't just say it's only used to test server side validation. But you know, for what we've done here, mostly a lot of things, server side validation. You know, validating inputs from the user. You know, all those things. Server side validation can actually help prevent you know some of these issues we've seen here. For example me when i when i try to swap um um sender's account number the server should be able to determine okay who is currently logged on ah, i'm logging as emma but why is this transaction uh why is this transaction coming from an account number belonging to michael it doesn't make sense you know bounce the transaction you know that is how your servers you know should should you know be interpreting requests from um, the client side. So um, I hope uh, that gives you an insight um, to what both you can do. So what can be done in this task where the developer does not release the source code of the help? Um, as we can see, all this thing that we're actually testing is not the source code of the application. So if um, it depends on the, what the organization, the SLA you update with the developer anyway, if the application is not developing else. Um, if your SLA state that before any application that be developed, you know, what's it called, develop or come into your own environment, you have to get the source code and you review and the developer agree. Fine and good. But if the application that maybe developer, the SLA states, okay, I'm not going to release my source code. So why just wait, you have to compile the source code code and give you the application. So what you're going to do now is just the dynamic testing instead of doing a static um, analysis of the code. So also you have the application, all those things that we're doing is not, we don't have the source code of the application. It's just the APK or the RES version of the application that we're playing in and we're seeing all this vulnerability. So it depend, actually depends on what you have, um, the SLA you have with the developer. But with the in house application, fine. That one is even easier because definitely you're going to have access to the source code. So you will do a, a static code analysis on the uh, source code. But trust me, sometimes, um, but not even sometimes, most of the time, they are, the source code analysis will not tell you that someone can swap an account. So that's why you have to combine the two testing together, both the dynamic and static analysis together. All this intercepting, those source code will not show you that someone can intercept. And move from one um, user to another, or can reset another password. Source code analysis will not show you all those things. Is this um, money the middle that can, you can use to simulate those kind of attack? So I hope that's answered your question. 
Okay. Okay. Let me just um, add while answering the next question. Um, I know we've talked about you know payments, transfers, you know, and all that. This is not all you can see, you know, um, when doing such assessments. Like I showed you, you can view details of another person's account. It doesn't have to be transactional. Say, for example, it is, uh, I can see we're talking about, um, this question is about a Sage application. Um, in as much as, you know, Sage and, uh, you know, companies alike are um, big companies, obviously, they, before they roll out any application, they definitely should have had it tested and all that. But, um, you know, some of those applications could be, it could be a HR application, it could be, you know, anything that is housing um, information about people. If I'm able to, Swap, say for example, HR IDs. I'll be able to see, you know, information about another person. Maybe the person's salary details, the person's um, disciplinary cases. You know, whatever it is, and even things around password changing. I can just um, change the passwords of if your application has, you know, some certain kinds of flaws. I might be able to, you know, swap. Um, instead of changing my own pass, the password to my account, I'll be able to, you know, swap IDs and eventually effect a password change on somebody else's, you know, account. So, you know, these are some of the things that happen, you know, around applications that are not also, um, that are not um, transactional apps or mobile banking or, you know, what, whatever the case is. So, um, talking about um, the application in general, the, the Sage application that is being asked here. Um, I mean, for it can be tested, but then, you know, one thing about um, when you're doing, you know, uh, penetration tests or security assessments, you actually need to get the buying of the owner of the asset or the application. You know, you can't just go, except, you know, you're doing it in a black box manner, in a manner that, you know, you're just trying to, find any you know vulnerability just out there if you are caught i mean you'll be able you should be able to um, bear the bronze you know but for um, such uh, enterprise applications like this it's better to carry the you know maybe the sales vendor or the sales support or whoever you know it, that you have to interface with with this application you know to let them know your concerns they can also you know we find out that a lot of them Sometimes they have teams that carry out, you know, such security assessment. Perhaps you can, you know, request for such reports, you know, to give you some certain level of comfort, you know, before you roll it out to your, to your users or your customers or, or whoever. So I hope that answers that. Can I use FedEx and BobFit to see Zoho? weaknesses. Zoho, can you remind me, can you just, what, um, what the Zoho, I'm not seeing that somewhere, but I'm not really sure I can remember what it is. Uh, I'll get back to that. Okay. Is there an automated tool in the market for carrying out detailed OWAS top 10 review of the mobile app? Ah, I mean, tools are being released on a daily basis. <laughs> um, I'm going to answer from our own perspective. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, from now, there might be something out there. But for us, what we do is we, we actually have, you know, a, we use a combination of, you know, a lot of tools to actually um, achieve a wholesome review of a mobile app, which obviously will cover you know, the OWAS top 10, you know, for example, use, you know, things like Bob Suits, mobile security fr framework, you know, a number of other things to, you know, um, have an in-depth, you know, dynamic as well as static analysis, you know, of a, of a mobile app. So um, there could be a number of tools we can, we can, we can take this offline and, you know, maybe get back to you on, on an actual tool that you may be able to use. Um, what exactly uh, made this application exploitable? Okay, so first and foremost, since the test app, it was, you know, actually deliberately made 
um, to have vulnerabilities. You know, that was the idea behind the application. Um, nonetheless, there are, you know, obviously other applications that people must have developed with good intent, but for one or two reasons, may have fallen short of, you know, some security practices, and then they become vulnerable. So it could be due to, you know, a number of things. It could be due to how the app has been developed. If your app, for example, has SQL injection vulnerability, there's something that your app is not doing, you know, to handle inputs correctly. Do you understand? So it's able to accept inputs that, you know, are harmful and can, you know, inject codes into the database, you know, of the application. So that could be a fallout of, you know, bad coding practice or, you know, um, uh, limitation of security knowledge of the developer, you know, so it could, it could be a, a, a fallout of, you know, um, anything, basically. The whole idea is if you are able to understand what the vulnerability is and understand, you know, the concept or have a direction of what you need to do to fix it. Uh, maybe I should add to this. Um, sometimes uh, your application may not be vulnerable. You may be the integration to the top party application on, from your own application and make your application be vulnerable. I will give you a scenario. Um, I've tested an application before whereby um, they are using it to get a transcript and whereby from the front end, when you try to manipulate the amount you want to pay um, and you send it to the server, the server was still going to bring the exact amount for you. That means at that particular point, they're actually validating. But when that um, application leaves that end and send it to the payment gateway, we change it the price again. And I say that at that point in time, at the payment gateway end, they are not validating. That is why we're able to pay lesser than the amount. So that's why when you are doing top party integration, you have to test your application end to end, not that you test your own bit and leave the integration alone. So you have to make sure that you test your application from end to end with whatever integration, top party integration you are doing so that you'll be sure that everybody is secure. If not, if they are not secure, trust me, it will affect your own application too. Okay. So you want to take this one? It's okay, you can. No, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, as a developer, what practice were you Okay, um, for this, to be honest with you, um, there are various things that you can look at for. That's why OWASP um, come up with all that often related to mobile application, which I've um, explained earlier. And um, there's a training that you can attend that will help you a lot. Um, it's called a secure coding training. That secure coding training, which um, my organization to facilitate, is going to help you and show you what are the kind of things. That one is more details related to code. Um, developer, let me put it that way, so that they will be able to see what kind of, kind of issue your application can have, so that we'll be able to have the understanding. And when you're coding, you, you, you will be conscious of putting security in place. So I will recommend that um, course for you if you're in, doing secure coding training. is actually a nice course for you to do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can um, yeah. I'd like to know I would like to know the career paths that this angle of security can fall into. A mobile app tester, mobile app security tester, or security analyst. Or is it nice to have knowledge for any security career paths? I mean it, it's this what we've just done is a pretty hands-on um uh is a pretty hands-on um, um, session. So it's, it's definitely if you are aiming to be a mobile app tester, that you know, would help. But I don't really think um, uh, that is an elaborate career path that one should you know, be angling to just focus on. I mean, you can't just um, say you just want to be a mobile application security tester. Yes, if you're an application security tester, okay, that includes web applications, APIs, you know, and the likes, yes, but, you know, specifically to mobile app, um, I mean, I would, I would say that is not advisable just to be focusing on mobile apps, you know, and if you, you know, look at it, 
from you know another angle having this knowledge actually helps you to even test other things this what we've done here is practically you know maybe just a difference of you know setup in one or two ways but it's the same way you actually assess web applications the same way you assess you know apis you understand so it actually you know opens you up to um a, a whole lot of other things you know and of course if you are aiming to be you know a, a a senior security personnel in the future maybe a CISO and all that you know definitely you know having this understanding when you are talking to your uh you know subordinates you know you'll be able to you know adequately pass information you know make sure understand what is what needs to be done understand you know when they have problems you know and all that so this kind of hands-on understanding is actually you know very helpful you know all the way um okay can api beans be intercepted if yes what are the measures one can put in place to safeguard so apis um naturally apis are meant to communicate between um is like a communication pattern for machine to machine right naturally you don't just see apis um uh uh you know, just out there like web applications, except, you know, there's, you know, information, there's information disclosure vulnerabilities that can lead you to, you know, expose such information. But naturally, APIs, you know, are built, you know, for machines to communicate, maybe from server to server, you know, and all that. So you don't exactly just, you know, see them out there. The way you can test APIs adequately is from whatever that is consuming that API. So say, for example, I've developed an API to, um, uh, you know, maybe retrieve usernames from somewhere, right? The app that is consuming that API, um, maybe ABC app, it's from that app that will initiate that request. As you can see on my Bob suit, that is why I, you know, sent some things to repeater and you were able to see, you know, so this, you can call this account summary. We can assume that this account summary, you know, is an, API endpoint that I'm actually trying to call on the backend server. So now I can see it, you know, I can manipulate it, I can do whatever I want to do with it, send it to the server, see the server's response, you know, and, you know, start playing around with it. So that is actually what I can, you know, do. That is, you know, one of the best ways, you know, to test APIs. There are a whole lot of other things, but in this context, you know, that is um, um, the way to do it. How can we fix the vulnerabilities detected by Bob suits? Uh, okay. So fixing a vulnerability um, is, um, what do they call it, is subject to what the vulnerability is. I mean, Bob suits can identify 1,000 vulnerabilities. Each vulnerability has different characteristics. You know, but for um, this particular session, I mean, the vulnerabilities that we've identified, uh, most of them, can be fixed by, you know, doing things like server side validation, you know, making sure that if it's a banking app, making sure that the server, um, the application server now um, validates inputs coming from the clients that is coming from, you know, the mobile application. You know, if that is done appropriately, you know, you shouldn't have, you know, some of these vulnerabilities we've seen. Although Bobsuit can actively um, identify a number of other vulnerabilities which would require, you know, a different remediation approach. So it really depends on what the vulnerability is and, you know, um, what you need to do to fix it. And most times, a lot of these vulnerabilities are actually, you know, things that you have to go down into the code. So um, developers have to be involved in this. They have to, you know, you have to explain the vulnerability to them and they have to understand, okay, this is what the issue is. So in their mind, they will already know that, okay, ah, I have to go to this function and, you know, tweak this particular code. I have to do this, I have to, you know. So they already have that understanding. You as a tester or you as a security person, you might not necessarily, you know, know how to code. I personally, I just have, you know, the, um, little understanding of, you know, development as in actively coding. But then if I need to talk to a developer to, okay, say, um sir you need to do this you need to do this 
we need to do this to prevent these vulnerabilities, you know, I'll be able to, it's just, you know, being able to, you just need to be able to understand what the vulnerability is and, you know, the best way to tackle it. Do we offer one-on-one -on -one training? Um, Femi, do you want to? Yeah, I love this, right? Yeah, the next one, you want to handle all that? One-on-one -on -one training. Uh, we don't we always do um corporate training so that we want to make you responsible but if um if we have another a training coming up and um sure you can we can we can validate where you're working for and your intent not that you want to use it for malicious purposes yes we can do one-on-one -on -one training Regard against reverse engineering using JDEX. Okay, um, the next question How best can we hide encryption keys in applications uh, to guard against reverse um, engineering using JDEX? So, um, Basically, you can do a couple of things. Um, so usually there's what we call, you know, there's an encryption key. You can also actually encrypt, you know, those encryption keys, you know, to, you know, give basically like doing a, having a data encryption key and a key encryption key, you know, to um, increase the levels, um, you know, of, um, of, you know, difficulty levels in decrypting whatever, uh, thing you have to encrypt um, so I think we need to move a bit faster so that okay. um, I think we can let me say let just answer something the other one maybe we just answer the um, mail um. How do you um, know? Maybe she can start this. Just, just look through. Apologies, we might not be able to answer. There's still a whole lot of other questions. Uh, maybe just look through and say the one that we can answer now. Okay, there was one about. Um, okay, I'm seeing. Does your company carry out this review as a service? Yes, we do. We can that, yes. There's no one about um, how do you mitigate brute force and broken access control. Um, you know, I explained earlier for brute force, you can use things like, um, you know, account lockout mechanisms or, you know, um, device cookies, you know, to tag devices that attempt to connect to applications. You know, say, for example, you are using your mobile phone now or mobile phone browser, or, you know, the application on your mobile phone to, um, initiate you know to do whatever you need to do on your mobile app your mobile app should be able to you know export or get the a unique identifier from that your phone you know and send along with the request so that you know there's <laughs> some sort of tagging to that your particular request so once if you do that if you implement that once there's any um uh you know brute force attempt maybe the application is seeing that there, there are tens, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 concurrent requests, you know, in the space of maybe two or three seconds coming from a particular device with this device ID. It knows that, okay, there is, you know, some form of forcing attack that is, you know, on the cards. So you can know what to adequately do. So basically, you can also look it up. Something they call device cooking and um, account lockouts. You can use that too. Um, prevent brute force and of course access control open access control um, majorly server-side validations and ensuring that people are not given uh, um, granted access to what they have not been, pro been pro profiled for so say for example I'm logging as Ikene and I'm trying to request a resource that belongs to Femi the application should be intelligent enough you know to know that this resource is for Ikine and meant for all Ikine. 
when it sees that Femi is trying to request a resource that belongs to Ekene, it should deny Femi. So that's basically, I mean, that that's the high level description of it, but I can assure you there's, you know, a code level, um, you know, description of this, which I, I believe developers, you know, will be able to interpret and put on, on paper. Okay, um, Ekene, so let's just um, answer two more questions. We'll take one, I'll just look for one and we'll take the other one. So I think the other question, um, they can, you get, um, you can send their, uh, email to us, um, trust me, we're going to answer the question because of time. So I will take this, um, so I think the application will protect a very value assessment certificate and domain name. Will this money, the middle attack be possible given that the transaction will be encrypted? Yes, even if you get your certificate from the best, um, uh, what's it called, vendor, uh, I will still do money, the middle attack. The only thing that you can do for me, for mobile, for me not be able to intercept um, this money, the middle attack, if, if it's too what we call a certificate pinning. So what though, there's a way to bypass certificate pinning, which is a long process, but please, um, we have put one of the control in place, which make it difficult for me in the first place. So what certificate pinning does is, you'll have embedded your own certificate that it's only this certificate that the server should use to communicate with that mobile. Even if I replace my certificate with the Bob certificate, because what I'm doing is, that's why I installed Bob certificate on the, on the phone. So that Bob certificate is used to communicate with your server. But if you are doing certificate pinning, in fact, I will not even be able to log in because as this, the mobile phone does not recognize that certificate, it will not allow me to go in unless I now find a way to bypass that certificate pinning, which is a long process. So but your normal certificate does not stop me to do money the major attack. It does not. So I think you should take one and it should end it. Okay. Um, somebody just wants a recap of the whole session. Okay, um, let me just use the opportunity to, you know, go through, um, you know, on a high level, everything. So basically, um, this session, I mean, from the pr practical um, point of view, was just to showcase, uh, you know, some security flaws in mobile applications. You know, mostly, I know a lot of us use um, fintech applications, banking applications, you know, and the like. So um we're able to showcase um with the use of buff suits um to intercept traffic coming from a mobile application http traffic you know so for everything that um the user of the mobile application attempted to do we were able to intercept this traffic you know view it manipulate whatever you know um thing was coming as a request and you know pass on to the back end server and see how you know the response was so um some of the vulnerabilities that we're able to identify we're able to transfer you know money we're able to ma manufacture money first and foremost we're able to even do you know carry out a brute force attack on the application you know um I'm sure you know what the brute force attack is where you know you run uh you run through a word list on maybe a login form and try to trying to guess Usernames and passwords, like the correct combination of both, you know, that can be used to log on to the application. And on the business logic, business logic um, bit of it, we're able to, you know, swap accounts, uh, introduce negative integers. So, for example, I want to send uh, Mr. A ten thousand naira somewhere along the line. I intercept the traffic and, you know, uh, introduce minus. So instead of Mr. A getting credited with ten thousand naira. You know, I'll end up being the one being credited. Mr. A ends up being the one debited. And we also looked at, you know, some things around um, reverse engineering, where we were able to decompile, you know, the, the, the APK of the mobile application. We we're able to decompile it and, you know, see some things, see that the code was not obfuscated, you know, could see different you know, methods or functions, classes and all that. And, you know, the risk in this is somebody could easily, um, you know, re-engineer this code that they've seen, repackage it, maybe put their malicious, um, whatever malicious thing that they want to include inside and um, repackage it and re-upload to wherever. And, you know, have, perhaps it could be your customers or whoever, you know, downloading this application and, you know, start defrauding them, you know, and also, when you reverse engineer applications, you know, we're able to 
for this application in particular, we're able to see, um, you know, some crypto cryptographic keys. We're able to see some hard coded keys or passwords, and we're able to see some other um, endpoints that the application communicates with that we wouldn't have known, you know, from anywhere. You know, we're able to see an endpoint that logs um, user login activities. You know, and we're able from there, we're able to gather uh the list of usernames a list of account numbers belonging to people that had recently logged on to the application so i mean that's just a brief um highlight of of everything um so i think with that we can um, uh, okay, um, um, let me just answer this question uh, someone just a question now uh, i'm saying with a vpn stolen money the middle attack um like we said there are two kind of attack there's application layer attack and there's a network layer attack for network layer attack, yes, your VPN will store that. But for application layer attack, with all this one that we are showing you, your VPN will not stop that kind of attack. So I think um, so that people will understand that. So if you are using VPN, application layer attack, VPN will not stop that. What VPN is just doing is to encrypt your data if you're on the same network. I'm trying to sniff your network. And before you send your data out, he, he encrypts it. That's what uh, the network layer, but not at the application layer. So I think um, that's that. So we can, we can wrap it up. Okay. Um, thanks everyone for um, being part of this session. I mean, this is the first of its kind. Uh, maybe it was spurred by, you know, the lockdown, the ongoing lockdown, but um, hopefully we um, aim to have, you know, more sessions like this, you know, definitely um, um, people will be notified um to to join when you know we come up with any of any of such um so thank you very much um you can also you know reach out to us you know for other security advisory um if you if you so wish and you know we'll be happy to to hear from you so thank you and um make sure you stay safe so thank you for your time sorry for taking like an extra 30, 30 minutes so thank you and have um, a nice day or enjoy the rest of your day.